share something weird with you. Weird, 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 weird story. Uh, if you've got a Bible, you want to turn to Mark chapter 2. Um, actually, I'm going to be in an Amplified, so you may want to just listen or you can kind of follow along if you can. Uh, I don't have an Amplified Bible, but I've got an Amplified phone. So it works, right? So if you've got an Amplified phone, you can go ahead and open that up. Uh, Mark chapter 2, there's this cool story. And uh, it says uh, in verse 1, And Jesus, having returned to Capernaum, after some days it was rumored about that he was in the house, probably Peter's. And so many people gathered together that there was no longer room for them, not even around the door. And he was discussing the word. That's a very odd, very odd statement. Uh, some translations say he was preaching or teaching the word to them. But the way this really reads is like it's not that he's talking about what we would say, just preach the word, you know. Well, we, when we say, man, I wish somebody would just preach the word, we really don't want anybody to do that. Well, we want somebody to tell us what we want to hear. Um, what Jesus was preaching, I think, goes back to something that was happening behind the scenes, okay? And I'm not going to go in long into this. This is a little sidebar for you. So if you want to check out for a few minutes, I'm going to just... It's all right. But uh, in John 1, John starts out writing his gospel, and he says that in the beginning was the Word, and he goes on and says the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word uh, came to the world and gave life to everyone. And, and he talks about the Word being... Messiah, right? And, and here Jesus is teaching them the Word. And, and so from my perspective, I think behind the scenes, a lot of times Jesus taught about the Messiah calling the Messiah the Word. Now you would say, well, wasn't Jesus Messiah? Yes, He was. But if you'll notice in all of His teachings, Jesus would never say, I'm the Messiah. Because he wanted that revelation for people. He wanted people to have that revelation from God. Because I personally feel like that I can teach you something, but you'll forget it before you hit the door, right? But if God teaches you something, it kind of sticks with you. It, it, it's like, I've heard, but then when God says it, it's like, wow, man, I've, I've like really heard. And, and there's a total difference. So as Jesus is teaching, I think there's, He's teaching the Word, so He's preaching and talking to them about the Word. And I think He's talking to them probably about the Kingdom of Heaven and about Messiah coming. So that's just the sidebar. Now everybody come back. because that, that was for you guys who just with curious minds, right? It says uh, in verse 3, Then they came bringing a paralytic to Him who had been picked up and was being carried by four men. And when they could not get to a place in front of Jesus because of the throng, they dug through the roof above him. And when they had scooped out an opening, they let down the thicky, thickly padded uh, quilt or mat upon which the paralyzed man was laying. Now get this picture. you got to remember, these are like... Uh, maybe adobe type homes they've got a, a roof that's piled with like grass and hay and sticks and dirt and stuff like that so what's happened is these these four friends decide jesus is in the house so we need to get our buddy there right these are good friends because like i don't know man how many of you guys would like okay i'll take you you mean take you up on the roof i don't know Take you up on the roof and dig a hole and drop you down in front of Jesus. I don't know, man. I don't think it works that way. I think if Jesus wanted to heal you, you'd just be healed, right? I don't want to do a whole lot of work. That sounds like a pretty involved process. So, so these guys are, are better friends than, than I am. I don't like digging in the dirt, especially when it's on somebody's roof. You ever thought, what if they got the wrong house? Like, once they got on the roof, they're like, somebody's sitting there, and boom, what's going on? Somebody drops out, paralyzed on your floor. So anyway, he drops in in front of Jesus. 
Get this, though. And when Jesus saw their faith, their confidence in God through him, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Uh, Your sins are forgiven you and put away. That is, get this. And and these little princes in the Amplified, these are uh, expounding on the word from what the uh, translation word from the original, from the original context of the scriptures. It says your your sins are forgiven and put away. That is, the penalty is remitted. The sense of guilt is removed and you are made upright and in right standing with God. That's pretty good, huh? Now I want you to think about something. That's a very weird thing, right? Because who had the faith here? This guy's sins were forgiven, but who carried him up there? Who did the work? Who took him there? His friends, his friends took him. They, they were, they were faith. You have to have a lot of faith. Like if you're going to pull this off, right? So his friend had the faith that gets his sins forgiven. Now, I'm sure he could have said, nah, it's too crowded. Let's go on back home. And, and they probably would have. So this guy has faith too. I'm not saying he doesn't, but, but I'm saying their, their faith has to do with his healing okay so we got this right Jesus says your sins are forgiven right now what happens next is what I wanted to talk to you about today so all that was just leading up to what we were getting to it says in verse 6 now some of the scribes were sitting there holding a dialogue with themselves as they questioned in their hearts Why does this man talk like this? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins, remove guilt, remit penalty, and bestow righteousness instead except for God alone? And at once become fully aware in his spirit that they thus debated within themselves, said to him, why do you argue, debate, reason, about all this in your hearts. Which is easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven and put away, or to say to him, rise and take up your sleeping pad or mat and start walking about and keep on walking. But that you may know positively and beyond a doubt that the Son of Man has the right and authority and the power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralyzed man, I say to you, arise, pick up your mat, pick up your Uh, pick up and carry your sleeping pad or mat and be going home. And at once he rose and picked up the sleeping pad or mat and went out before them all. So they were amazed and recognized and praised and thanked God saying, we have never seen anything like this before. Now, the Amplified's wordy, right? Because every time it says a word, it repeats it like 10 times. But I think it's good because it kind of drills in this idea that Jesus did something that the religious people didn't think that men should do, right? And I went back and I started looking, and I don't find in the Old Testament where there was anybody forgiving sins. I didn't see that. I saw a process through sacrifice and through the the law that God made for sins being forgiven, right? But I didn't see anyone forgiving sins. And so this where they're getting this blasphemy is is evidently it was against the law or God's will for a man to forgive sins. But Jesus is coming and he's different, right? Because he has been given authority. And I think this authority was displayed there and in many other places in the Bible where you see these teachings of Jesus and they say, What is this authority? And when they're talking about authority, it's a Greek word that means that that has real, like God-given power, like supernatural. And so they say Jesus teaches as one who has real power, 
real authority, not like the scribes, they say, and that, that really makes the scribes so happy to think that this, this guy that's hanging out with these losers would have more power or authority in his speaking and teaching than they do. And so what I, wanted, I want you to realize is that Jesus was doing something that hadn't been done before, and the religious people of the day hated that because he was forgiving sins. But then I want you to turn back over uh, to Matthew, the book of Matthew, chapter 6. And I want to go down to verse 9. And this is something that all of you are probably very familiar with. Anybody ever heard of the Lord's Prayer? Right? I hate that one. I, I, have you guys ever read that? Or did I like, just say it without ever thinking about it? I don't want to pray that. Like, I mean, have you ever, let's read it. Let's, let's just read it and judge for yourself. Jesus is teaching him about prayer here. He says, uh, when you pray, don't be like the Pharisees and the hypocrites who do this all for show and whatever. He says, when you pray, he says, be, you know, go into your prayer closet and pray like this. And in verse 9, he says, therefore, like this, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed or kept holy, holy uh, is uh, set apart, Different above is your name, okay? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's pretty impressive there because what Jesus is actually praying as Messiah is what's physically, what's, what's actually going on at the time. Messiah comes and repairs and restores the world to God, right? So what's happening is God who was there and man who was here, heaven is actually coming to earth. Man and God are being reconciled. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus is bringing it in. So he's praying now that, that God, your kingdom come and your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. He's asking for provision, meeting, meeting our needs. But then he says this, forgive us of our debts, uh, trespasses, sins in some translations, as we also have forgiven, left or remitted or let go of the debts of and have given up resentment against our debtors. That's the part I don't like. I like to highlight that with a black highlighter. <laughs> because that makes it all go away. As he's, as he's praying, though, he says, pray like this. God, forgive me. Cancel my debt. And, and, and the word transgressions, uh, it's, it's funny. It, it actually literally means slip-ups. Mistakes of... Uh, uh, errors. Uh, more times than not, the same word is translated uh, um, failure. Forgive me of my failures. Okay, so forgive me of my failures the way I forgive everybody else of theirs. Let's pray like that. Is that easy? That stinks, right? And he says, And lead us or bring us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, power, and the glory forever. Amen. Verse 14, If you forgive people their trespasses, their reckless and willful sins, leaving them, which is another, some of the English words for the translation, to leave or let alone, right? To, to let alone or leave alone. Leaving them, letting them go, all right? To forgive, to let go. Okay, 
uh, forgiving them their trespasses, their reckless, willful sins, leaving them, letting them go, and giving up resentment, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, their reckless and willful sins, leaving them, letting them go, and giving up resentment, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. That's Jesus. That's weird. That's hard, right? Like, does the Bible really say that if I don't forgive, that God won't forgive me? Is that Jesus' teaching? So that becomes challenging, right? And I want to look at this from those two scriptures. And I want to look at maybe we just don't see things in the right light. I've got a weird place I'm going. And it may be hard to get there because if you've been in church, you probably think you know where I'm going. But I'm not going there. Okay. Okay, first of all, I want to say this. Forgiveness is the hardest thing in the world. It is the F word. It is. It's the hardest thing I think there is to do. Because even when we say we forgive, man, do we not feel that grudge, that resentment deep in us? And, and a lot of times we're like, oh no, Jesus said to forgive, and I won't, God won't forgive me if I don't forgive, so I'm going to forgive him. You're forgiven. But then what happens when you walk in the Walmart? I mean, the first person you see in your stomach goes, Ugh. right? You go somewhere and you sit down and the person who has wronged you, hurt you, and legitimately, man, people hurt people. It's a fact of life, right? And, and the host comes and sets them down next to you, and you can't even eat in peace. Hey, but I forgave them, right? And I think we hang on to stuff so long and I think this verse has a lot to do, I think it's way deeper than we can grasp. I think forgiveness is one of the hardest things in life to understand, especially how does it work? How does the kingdom of heaven work? How does God work with us? Because right, Jesus came and died on the cross so God forgives the world of his sins, right? Yeah, I'm not tricking you. That's true. You guys believe that? Like Jesus was the ultimate. He was the last, the final sacrifice for sin. And if he wasn't, we would have to be crucifying him over and over and over and over again. Paul goes on this long rant in one of his writings how, how we would still have to be crucifying God if Jesus didn't take care of sin, reconcile God, right? Right? Reconcile God and his people. So what's this teaching of Jesus? Does it not present you with dilemmas and questions about how the Bible works? Is this verse true, but the other verse is not true? Is this, is, and some people actually think that when Jesus died for sins, well, he really didn't. And I know nobody says that out loud. But the teaching says he didn't really. He only died for the sins of those who respond to him. But is that what it says? That's not what it says, is it? That God reconciled mankind to him. Did he not? Did he cancel the sin of humanity that was separating him from his people? That's what Jesus, that's what Jesus' cross was all about, right? So this verse is tough, right? It, it's very confusing. 
But then I start to think about forgiveness and I start to think about the people that I don't forgive. The people who I see coming at Walmart and, and everything gets weird, right? And I would say that probably most of them have no concept or idea that they ever did anything to me. You ever say this to your wife and you don't you say it to her when you're in private because you don't want to sound like a crybaby out in public? And you say, they acted like nothing happened. Anybody ever say that? I saw them, they just walked up just like nothing happened. And the truth is, in their minds, nothing happened. They don't understand. But for years, we're carrying around bitterness and anger and hatred and rage and all of these things that cause all these bad feelings and these bad emotions. But by, by like somehow, if we carry this, we're going to show them. I will never, ever, ever let them off. I will not give that person a free pass in our church. And, and a lot of you guys may think you're alone, but a lot of you guys have dealt with being abused as children, physically, emotionally, sexually, and you carry a lot of hurt. And, and those things are real. And I'm not, I'm not saying that, that, that any of that should be just all bygones. I mean, it t you, you, you have to go through a healing process, Right. But the truth is this, we sit here and spend our whole lives in such darkness. I know this one guy, this guy that I uh, have had relationship with in the past, and, and he's the most angry, bitter, hateful, closed off, shut down person I've ever been around. And I wonder, if he realizes that the prison he's in is his own prison. Something horrible happened to him when he was a kid. Horrible, unthinkable. And man, he will not. And, and, and actually, he came to church here for a while and he left because he, he just would not. He, he talked to me. He said, There's, that's not right. You shouldn't have to forgive that. And that's a valid point. I mean, our ways of speaking, I'm like, I mean, what do you say? Yeah, you're right. Uh, it's a whole lot easier to teach than it is to practice, right? And I understand that. But what, what he could never grasp was the person who did this to him didn't care. He didn't, didn't care. There was no way he was going to apologize or make amends. It was a criminal act, and he never had to pay society either. Just living his life. But there's something inside that says, man, I'm not letting him off the hook. But what we don't realize is by not letting them off the hook, we're keeping ourselves on the hook. When we hold that bitterness and that resentment and that unforgiveness in us, we are the ones who are unforgiven. And I think that's the way this verse works. I don't, I don't think it means God's not going to forgive you. I think you're not going to experience freedom while you hold this unforgiveness. But see, we might can start to understand that but there's this concept that we're not really connecting with. And that's what I really wanted you to see today is that there is this unbelievable power of the Holy Spirit in forgiving sins. I want you to get this. This is special. See, in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, you couldn't forgive sin. You couldn't forgive sin. But when we read in Mark, Jesus forgave sin and the Pharisees and the scribes called him on it. You can't forgive sins. You're a blasphemer. No, I come under a different authority. I'm under a new power. 
I have the power and authority to forgive sin. I don't have baggage. I don't have to carry baggage. See, I have the power to forgive sin. And this is one of the most unknown and unappreciated things that happened in the new covenant. The coming of Messiah opened up a new covenant. And Jesus goes then and teaches, not the disciples. I want you to get this. In Matthew 6, where Jesus is teaching, he's not teaching his disciples. Who's he teaching? The Sermon on the Mount. He's teaching every low-life scumbag, criminal, jack wagon in the whole region, right? These guys weren't worthy. But what does Jesus teach them? He says, when you pray, pray like this. Father, forgive them. And he says, if you don't forgive sins, then it won't be forgiven you. So not only is Jesus saying it's good, he's actually saying we should. We should forgive sin. They got to remember who he's talking to. He's talking to people under the law, right? They've never heard anybody in their life saying that you can forgive sin. Jesus is teaching you can forgive sin. And we don't get it. We still are like, well, I'll pray that God will forgive your sin. And what does Jesus say? Forgive the sins of those who sin against you, right? You have power. You have authority. The power of God enables us to be able to forgive sin. And this is a gift. See, the ability to forgive is a new covenant idea. The ability to forgive transgressions and trespasses and sins and the ability to let it go, that's a gift. That's a gift. And if we ever learn not to hold on to things that people have done to wrong us and to hurt us, well, it's just weird. I don't know if it's getting old or God teaching or just a lack of energy and effort to hold grudges. Because it, it does take a lot of energy to hate everybody. I mean, it just wears you out. But I've found in my life over the last few years that I can be around anybody no matter what's happened in the past without those feelings, without needing them to pay, I'm going to show them they got to pay. And, and all I can attribute it to is that God became real to me. Like, He showed me, like, revealed to me in His teachings that holding unforgiveness is a prison that I built for myself. And that no matter what I think I can do, I can't punish anybody. I'm not that awesome. Like if I'm, I'm not going to be your friend. Well, who cares? Nobody cares. I feel, nobody cares if I'm their friend or not. I think, well, if I don't like them, man, that's, that's good. They're going to pay. Everybody's like, ooh, he don't like me. Let me stop my life. I realized I didn't have that kind of power over people. So I've let it go. And you know how freeing and liberating it is to let things go? From my perspective, people have done horrible things to me. People hurt my kid, which is it should be a death sentence, right? I mean, the whole hate thing, remember a few weeks ago, you can't just kill people, though. It's not right. <laughs> Even though you'd like to. You can't kill people. It goes, see, all of these teachings are tied together, man. Don't hate or you're committing murder. Don't judge or you'll be judged. By whatever judgment you're judging someone else, that's the judgment you're being held to. This is all the same teaching, right? This is, this is what Jesus is saying. Because we have, we can judge, we feel free. It's just 
that you're the one being held by that judgment. I've never judged anybody that held them to anything. It held me to it. Everything we do comes back on us. When we love, it comes back on us. But when we hate, it comes back on us. When we let it go, we're let go. But when we're going to make you pay, we pay. There's some of us here today, and I just feel like right now, there's some of us here today that are holding on to things that have ruined our lives. And it breaks my heart to see people I love and people I care about imprisoned because we just can't let it go. God, you don't know how bad they hurt me. I don't. I know how bad I've been hurt and I can kind of feel like I've never had anybody abandon me. My parents love me. They adore me. They think I'm the greatest. (laughs) Ask them. They don't lie either. I know people that your parents just didn't want you. I don't know how it feels. I can't imagine. I've seen people whose life frustrations they take out on their kids and you, it was taken out on you when you were kids and maybe did you take that out on your kids. And maybe all that anger and hatred and bitterness and rage and all those things that have built up over the years and those walls that have been put up and those feelings that make you sick deep down that hurt your heart so bad. And really, man, there's no other way to say it. You have to let it go. And I've heard people say, Todd, man, how do you just let it go? Well, here's what I've learned in my experience. Letting it go was so much easier than holding on to it. When you let it go, you just have to quit trying. Let it go. But to hold on to it, man, there's always challenges to holding on to it. You always got to come up with a plan on how to make them pay more and how to hurt them more, how to come down on them more, how to make life harder and worse for them. And you know what? You can't. Because people who do that to you, they don't care enough about you to even care that you're trying to hurt them. It's just hurting you. We're ruining our lives by holding on to things that we have been empowered by God to let go. Forgiveness is a gift of God. And I don't think you can truly forgive, and I mean truly just let it go, unless God's really real to you. Because I think it takes a power beyond human understanding. I don't think it's humanly possible for us to just let things go. What do you do when memories come up, right? What do you do when you have these memories that come up? I remember this one teaching, Jesus is like, you got to forgive. And, and Peter's like, well, you know, how many times should I forgive? Like seven. Calls it so cool of Peter. He's the, you know. And Jesus is like, well, I was thinking like, 70 times 7. What does that mean? year and a half? I think when those feelings come up, I have to let it go. And then tomorrow, when they come up, I have to let it go. And then tomorrow, when it comes up, I have to let it go. And tomorrow... When it comes up, I have to let it go. And when I'm walking through Walmart and I hear a parent talk to a kid the way my parent used to talk to me, I have to let it go because it all comes back in a flash. And when your husband touches you and that's the way somebody else touches you and you pull back, you've got to let it go. 
and you got to let it go 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 until it's gone one day you're going to see that person and you're just not going to feel that one day you're going to be healed one day it's going to be in the past one day you're going to be whole but not if you don't ever start start today I want you guys to bow your heads right now close your eyes and just this is what Jesus called your prayer closet when they would do it they'd pull a prayer shawl up over their head and they'd go into this this private place with God and I want you to go in that private place with God right now and, and here's what I want you to do and I want you to do this this is a very painful thing but I want you to go and find in your mind those people that have hurt you and that thing that they did to you that was so horrible and so terrible And I want you to see that person walking around free while you're bound up and tied up. Because see, that's what's really going on is that person has you bound up and tied up after all of these years. But now I want you to look and I want you to see God. And I want you to see Jesus and I want you to see His arms wide open. I want you to see the love in His eyes and on His face. I want you to feel and experience that drawing and that calming spirit that He gives us. And all He's whispering to you is let it go. And when you speak those words out of your mouth with the power and authority of Jesus behind it, I let it go. Those chains, those chains are coming off. You are forgiven. You are released. You understand, you today are free. You today are released. You today don't have to live and carry that with you ever again. You walk out of here today with your head high forgiven. You walk out of here with your head high with no one tying you up and binding you up in your life any longer. I want you to with the words in your mouth right now as you think of that, I want you to say it out of your mouth with the power of God behind you. I let it go. Right now, now is the time to say it. I let it go. There's something about saying it out loud. We were talking this week about words coming out of our mouth. Somehow we can have these things in our minds but when something happens when we speak it out of our mouth, it puts it out in the real world. And I, don't, I think this is one of those times where you're going to have to voice it. I let it go. I let you go. I let you go. I let you go. So he sings a song, it's called uh, Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. And right now, man, you feel that freedom? Are you experiencing that freedom that, that's come just by letting it go, by speaking those words, I'll let you go. See, that's the Spirit of God, that's the power of God consuming us. And where the Spirit of God is, there is freedom. I want you to live free. I want you to be free today. When we leave here, man, you don't have to ever 
be this way again. You'll never have to have those feelings again. You don't, and it's in, this isn't psycho bull crap where you just suppress everything and act like it's not there. I'm talking about freedom. Letting it go. Because when you suppress it, you make it worse. You cover all of those unforgiveness and all those hurts with darkness. And man, when you put it in darkness, it just grows and it, it, it just has its way with you. you. You don't have to live that way. Bring it into the light. Let it go. You gotta go ahead and stand with me. I wanna pray for you. She said no.